This is going to continue the study on finding the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Genesis. Something that I feel like would really get people interested in the Bible is when they find out that you can find Jesus Christ on every page and that these stories in the Old Testament are not just stories. They're showing you the Lord Jesus Christ. They're showing you all kinds of things. But we're in chapter 37 today, and it's going to be the character named Joseph. Joseph is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, type of the Lord Jesus Christ in the entire Bible. So let's go through and look at Joseph here. So starting in Genesis 37 in verse 1, it says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock. Right off, you see something about Joseph that reminds you of the Lord Jesus. He's feeding the flock. So Joseph is a shepherd. The Lord Jesus Christ is a shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, it says, When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That's talking about at the rapture. That's when the chief shepherd's going to show up, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a shepherd. Joseph is a shepherd. Jesus Christ himself calls himself a shepherd. In John ten eleven, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He says in John ten twenty seven, uh, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's John ten eleven and 27, that he, he calls himself a shepherd. Now, Jesus feeds the flock. And in Psalms 119, 103, it says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How does Jesus feed the flock? He feeds the flock by you reading the Bible. He's gave you the word of God that you can feed on. That's how he feeds you. A Christian who won't read the Bible will starve to death, spiritually speaking. Spiritually speaking, if you do not read the Bible and you're a Christian, you're going to starve yourself to death. Most Christians see it as something that you just sit on grandma's shelf. They think it's, it's just, a, if they see somebody reading it, they think that's cute or something. They don't think that it's just something that you ought to do every day and that this has the key of everything in it, in, in the Word of God. In John, or Job 23, 12, it says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have, re I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Jesus Christ feeds the flock with the word of God. Do you esteem his words more than your necessary food? Imagine about how if you read the Bible as much as you ate or read the Bible as long as you spent eating throughout the day, how much more spiritually full you would be and how much better your Christian life would be. Do you esteem the words of his mouth more than your necessary food? Or take it a step further, even your unnecessary food. A lot of the food we eat is unnecessary. Taco Bell, Bojangles, uh, Chick-fil-A, all these little drinks on the side that you don't need, these sugary drinks. What if you enjoyed reading the Bible and studying the Bible as much as you loved going out to eat? Think about how much more spiritually full you would be if you were let, letting Jesus feed you. Jesus feeds the flock. But people enjoy their unnecessary food more. John six thirty five, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he, that, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus Christ feeds the flock. He's the bread of life. He's the living water. Daily Bible reading is how you're going to get fed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him be your shepherd. A lady told me one time, she said, I just don't feel like God's talking to me. And I said, are you reading the Bible? And she's like, no. Well, that's why. you got to read the Bible. For God to talk to you. He doesn't talk to you in an audible voice. There's this cool picture that you see on the internet with the guy uh, looking up at the sky saying, God, talk to me. And then in the next picture, you see God 
It's God's hand come from the sky and he's holding a Bible. That's a good illustration of how God talks to people today. He's not talking to you in dreams and visions. He's talking to you through the Bible itself. You talk to him in prayer, you open the Bible, he's going to speak to you that way. He feeds you through the preaching of the Word. Listen to preaching on your headphones. The entire time that I'm at work, if I'm on break, I'm I'm reading or studying. If I'm working, I've got headphones in, I'm listening to preaching, and I'm listening to audio Bible. That way, I, I feel like I'm just constantly doing something beneficial. And I mean, I'm making money at the same time to provide for my family. So use your time wisely. Redeem the time. Multitask. When you're going through your Bible with these studies like this, take your... Take a, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm taking a red highlighter. I'm, I'm highlighting each time that I see Jesus in the Old Testament. That way when I go back through and read it, I say, well, there's Jesus there. There's Jesus there. Get very familiar with your Bible. It's how you get fed. An open Bible in a, in a room draws more attention than anything. I can open my Bible in the break room. Uh, you know, the whole atmosphere changes. And, I mean, you, you got it on your phone, too, but the thing about having it on your phone is nobody knows you're reading the Bible. If you're just reading it on your phone, they'll think you're on Facebook. I'm not saying that's wrong or anything, but, I mean, it's just a really good witness and a good light in a workplace to have somebody with a King James Bible open there in the break room. So, just like Joseph feeds the flock, Jesus is the chief shepherd and he feeds the flock. All right, ver the next verse, or still verse 2. It says, And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. So he brought unto them their evil report, just like that's the Lord Jesus Christ did when he was walking around on earth. He said in John 7, 7, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. He brought to the world conviction about their sins. He told them that they were they're evil. He was exposing the evil things that they were doing. Just like Joseph exposed the evil things his brothers were doing. And Paul himself said in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. When you go around as a Christian... And you may not even say anything about somebody's sins. For example, I, I don't just go up to a lost person and tell them what they're doing is wrong. Because that's what lost people do. They do stuff that's wrong. That's what most Christians do. They're doing stuff that's wrong. I don't go up to that person and tell them to stop what they're doing. That's none of my business. I'm not going to go up to a lost person and say, hey, you need to quit drinking. I'm not going to go up to uh, someone and say, you need to quit fornicating. But I can live, try my best to live a, a righteous life in front of them, not cussing, not telling dirty jokes, reading my Bible, and let them know that I'm a Christian. And they start feeling bad about their sinful condition, their self at that point. It, but the Lord Jesus Christ, He showed the world how evil it is, just like Joseph. Uh, he didn't condemn the woman taken in adultery, but he did say, go and sin no more. Uh, many times people will hate you because you're trying to live as close to being like Jesus as you possibly can. A woman said th that the Bible verse bumper stickers on my car were silly. You know why? Because she was under conviction. She saw me doing that and she thought that that was something that she probably needed to be doing but yet she wasn't doing it so she began to be convicted and jealous about it she also said that my gospel tracks were silly you know that's a strange thing for a christian to say that but i mean this was a professing christian woman who said these things and you know seeing those things brought to light before her eyes that she's doing evil You know, when I was in school, I hated the report cards because it showed how bad I was doing. Joseph brought the evil report of his brothers just like Jesus brings the evil report of the world. 
Now Jacob, in this in uh, verse three, it says, "Now Israel loved Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children." So Israel is Jacob. Uh, see, God gave Jacob another name. He made it Israel, just like He did with Saul. He named him the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul's old name was Saul of Tarshish. And he changed Jacob's name to Israel. So it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ is the beloved Son of the Father. In Matthew 17, 5. Uh, in Mark 1, 11, it says, And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And next, Joseph was a miracle birth, just like Jesus was a miracle birth. Jesus Christ is virgin born. That's a miracle. Joseph was the son of Israel's old age. In verse 3, chapter 37 and verse 3, it says, Because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. Right there's three things that remind us of Jesus in one verse. He made him a coat of many colors. And what, what does that remind you about Jesus? They also put on Jesus a significant piece of clothing. In Matthew 27, 28 through 31, it says, And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had... A, a, they put the crown of thorns on his head and they t took him off to crucify him. And then Jesus is going to be stripped of his clothes. Just like you're going to see how Joseph is stripped of his clothes. See, the similarities are are just amazing. But Joseph's brothers were jealous of the coat of many colors. And if you really live right, then God's going to take care of you. And people are going to get jealous of that. Number four, verse four. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. They hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And that reminds me of John fifteen twenty five. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. They hated the Lord Jesus without a cause. Just like the brethren hated Joseph. Joseph's brothers will represent Israel. Joseph represents Jesus. Israel hated Jesus. The, the Jews hated Jesus. Uh, just like Joseph's brothers hated him. And then if you look at John 15, 19, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated, hateth you. If you're living as close to like Jesus as you can, then the world's going to hate you. You can't be a Bible-believing Christian and not hate you. Joe Biden believes that LGBT rights, that the LGBT has more rights than Bible-believing Christians have. You know, the world hates Bible-believing Christians because we stand up for what's right. We're not buying into all the Black Lives Matter nonsense going on. We're not buying into all the homosexuality stuff going on. All these different things going on that the world's going along with, that Christians just aren't going along with. And that's why Christians will be persecuted and killed. That's why Christians have always been persecuted and killed. Because they're not going to go along with evil nonsense. John fifteen nineteen. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So the world's going to hate you just like Joseph's brothers hated him. They hated him because he's good. Now, Joseph's going to have that dream. It says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and beheld your sheaves. And behold, your sheaves stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. So right there, you see how Joseph has a dream that his brothers are going to bow down to him. And of course, they're mad about this, but this also reminds us of Jesus because when Jesus came the first time, he came into his own, his own received him not. 
The Jews rejected him. But here real soon, they're going to find out he is who he said he was, and they're going to bow down to him. And on top of that, everybody's going to bow down to him. Just like Joseph's brothers are going to bow down to him, the Jews are going to bow down to Jesus, and everybody else is going to bow down to Jesus too. In Philippians 2, 10 and 11, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there will be a day when every single person gets down on one knee and admits that Jesus is who he said he was. Every person. Now what else? It says in verse 8, it says, And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. That's exactly what they said about Jesus. You know, they didn't want to accept Jesus as king. They said, we have no king but Caesar. They said, crucify him, crucify him. And they hated him for his dreams and for his words. That's why they hated Jesus. Jesus came around. When he came down to this earth, he taught them as one having authority. His doctrine was with authority. And he condemned their sin. He said, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? They hated him for his words. That's what got him in so much trouble was his words. They weren't jealous of his looks. They were jealous of how he lived and the things that came out of his mouth. And looking on down in verse 11 of Genesis 37, it says, And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. You know why they led Jesus Christ to be crucified? It says in Mark 15, 10, they delivered him for envy. That's why they crucified him. They were envious. Okay, in verse 13, it says, And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. So Joseph seeks to please the Father. He's seeking to please his father, Israel, which is Jacob, just like Jesus Christ sought to please his father. He, he said, I came not to do mine own will, but the will of him, which is the father that sent me. He came into his own. And he's, uh, Joseph is going to be sent here to his brethren, just like Jesus came into his own. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And it says, And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it will be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him, just like they did Jesus Christ. Look at those words. They conspired against him to slay him. The reason I'm a conspiracy theorist is because there's a conspiracy against the Lord Jesus, against the Bible. Uh... The chief conspirator, which is the devil, has put in everyone's mind to go against the Bible. The rulers of this world are against the Bible. That's who gets in office. That's who becomes kings and presidents and things like that. You know, I mean, Trump's a good, I mean, compared to Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton. But he's nowhere near as good as a Bible-believing Christian would be as president. And I mean, I'm not saying I don't like him or anything. I'm just saying, imagine if you had a Bible-believing Christian as president. Someone that didn't go to a 50-something-year-old false prophet woman for spiritual advice. Imagine that. Imagine if he knew about the King James Bible. Imagine if he knew about the Bible issue. Imagine if he knew what your, just your pastor knows in your town, local town there. Your pastor, if you go to a Bible-believing church, your pastor has more wisdom in his pinky than the president has. You know, because the devil puts in leadership 
God allows the devil to put in leadership who he wants to, and he's not going to put a Bible-believing Christian there. But they conspired against Joseph to slay him. Just like in John 5, 16, it says, talking about Jesus, they sought to slay him. They conspired against him. The kings of this world have set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. It's, it's all a big conspiracy. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. They're mocking him, just like they mocked Jesus. It says, Come now therefore and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say. Notice it says, we will say. It's no different than what happened with Jesus. They're going to lie about why and how Jesus died. They lie about how Jesus died today. or they, Actually, they say that he didn't even die. They say he just passed out. But Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried and resurrected. See, these, his brethren, the brethren are going to lie about how Joseph died, just like people lie about how Jesus died. And it says, some, they'll say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. So Reuben would represent like Nicodemus was for Jesus in John seven fifty through 51. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So Reuben's trying to save him. It came to pass when Joseph was come to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors, just like they stripped Jesus out of that scarlet robe they put on him and they, they hung him naked upon the cross to hum humiliate him. They stripped Joseph just like they stripped the Lord Jesus. And it says, And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. What does that remind you of? Well, when Jesus Christ was on the cross in John nineteen twenty eight, he said, I thirst. Jesus Christ took our hell on the cross. When he was on the cross, he took our hell. And there's no water in this pit that they put Joseph in. When the rich man's in hell, Luke 16, 24, he says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. There's no water in hell. Jesus Christ took our hell on the cross and then he went into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He says, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What does it say in Ephesians? It says, he that ascended is he that first descended first into the lower parts of the earth. You know, all those verses that talk about Jesus Christ going down into the lower parts of the earth. But when he was on the cross, he said, I thirst. And they put Joseph in a pit, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh and going to carry it down to Egypt. Wow, look at that. They just they had the intention of killing Joseph. They put him down in the pit. And then they sit down to eat bread. Talk about, you know, not even being bothered about what just happened. They, they just have no conscience about it. Just like they watched the Lord Jesus Christ as he was on the cross. Listen to this in Matthew 27, 35, and 36. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. Just like here. It says, and they sit down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. See, they, it's just, it's the, it's the same story, but it's a different story. And yet it, this happened in 728 B.C., this thing with Joseph, separated by almost 2,000 years here. It's just amazing. If you don't believe the Bible, you ought to now. I mean, look at the similarities in the stories written by different authors. And now look at this. This is one of my favorite ones here in verse 26. It says, And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? What profit is it? Judah said, What profit is it? 
He says, Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Now look at this. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. So they sold Joseph to these Midianite merchantmen, to the Ishmaelites, for 20 pieces of silver. You know what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ? In Matthew 26, 15, Jesus Christ is sold for 30 pieces of silver. Now check this out. Who sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? Judas. Who sold Joseph? Judah. I mean, it's just too similar. Jodah, Judah, Judah, Judas sold him for 20 pieces of silver. Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Just very, very similar. Very amazing. Now, Going on, look at verse... We'll go ahead and finish up chapter 37. Look at verse 31. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. You know what Jesus Christ is coming back in in Revelation 19, 13? Clothed, clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. He's coming back with a vengeance the second time. They're not going to shed his blood. He's going to be shedding their blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father. So they brought that coat that had blood on it to the father, just like the father in heaven sees the blood. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he took that blood up to heaven. The father saw the blood, John twenty seventeen, And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat, an evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. So he's, uh, Joseph is brought to Egypt, just like Jesus, Mary, and Joseph flee to Egypt in Matthew 2, 13. So that's, that's just one chapter of the similarities, and I'm, I'm sure I missed some in chapter 37 there. I, I mean, I know I missed some. I mean, there's supposed to be 150 of them. But that's just incredible there how Joseph is a great type of the Lord Jesus.